All right, good morning. It is 11 a.m. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Carmen, can you hear me? Okay, great. All right, first I want to start um, this uh, session with uh, welcome back. I am uh, excited to have everyone back. I hope each of you had an opportunity to do what makes you happy over spring break. Um, the weather somewhat cooperated. It was nice, but cold. Um, but I hope all of you had a, uh, a much deserved rest and resting and relaxing vacation and are ready for the next eight and a half weeks as we wind down the 2021 school, school year. Um, I want to start today with, uh, again, grace and appreciation for the work that each of you are doing. You know, every time we have an opportunity or I have an opportunity to hear the work that's happening across the entire district, um, you know, and that's all levels of this organization, it, it continues to um, impress me and instill a sense of pride in what we're doing as uh, the Port Angeles School District pertaining to the hard work that we put in this year. Um, I want each of you to know, I know how hard each of you have worked this year to make all of the changes um, and the challenges that we've faced as an organization uh, to make that work. And um, in education, I have often said, we don't say thank you enough. And I thank each one of you for your hard work this year and making um, this as successful as we possibly can. Um, it's been challenging, but you're doing great work. Keep it up. And uh, I'm proud of your efforts. So I want to start today with uh, um, really I have a few things on my agenda. I want to talk about the transition to our delivery model for the end of this school year. And and I, I, I assume many of you have read the letter that was sent home to families, but I just want to outline that uh, real quickly. Um, I also want to talk about the SBAC, and I know this won't be a uh, uh, a topic of uh, satisfaction, but want to talk about the state of Washington SBAC um, concept and the federal government's expectations of uh, spring testing and what I know today. I want to talk about return to school next fall and, you know, all the changing um, uh, landscape around that. I want to talk about graduation. And then I finally want to talk just a little bit about um, you know, not letting our guard down and uh, staying focused on the mitigation or the, the COVID practices that we have in place, um, even though we're maybe in a different spot as it relates to the COVID experience. So I want to start with uh, um, the letter that I wrote to the community around the purpose for um, the change of primarily the elementary delivery model. And um, secondary did change a little bit based on uh, Governor Inslee's 30% requirement. So there has been some changes there as well. Um, but as we start looking at data now and moving into the future, um, you know, we have a population of students um, that simply have not done well in the COVID you know, delivery model. And um, that's system wide, you know, K-12, uh, we do know we have some students and some families that have really struggled. And, and some of the data that I outlined for the parents around the purpose for the AMPM model, I just want to brush on those real quickly today. Um, you know, one, it was really important for us to increase the frequency of our elementary students to come back on campus five days a week. I know there's an argument to be said, well, you know, it's not near as meaningful as the, you know, X number of hours we had in a two day model. But, you know, I've been out into many, many classrooms across the school district. And um, with without the um, class transitions, we've been able to take, you know, a um, condensed model um, of time and really accomplish more work and um, with smaller class sizes, be able to get down to differentiation and really helping students where they're at. And so, you know, principle number one for the change was really around taking the smaller class sizes that we have in the AB model at the elementary level 
and increasing the frequency um, and you know minimizing the disruptions and really um, maximizing um, you know the powerful work that we do uh, with each of our students each day and so that was you know key principle number one key principle number two is really about um, you know the the students that have had um, learning loss um, and uh, the uh, challenge that we have not only today but ahead of us um, you know, 40%, and this was, I appreciate the elementary principals putting this information together for us. They created kind of a rubric around um, students struggling at the elementary level. But um, in all five of our elementary schools, 40% of our students were failing to engage consistently online. That was a key factor in this decision. Four out of every 10 students were either not engaging or engaging uh, very little. Um, when it comes to academics, 43% of our students um, fell below the math standard and 46% of our students are falling below the reading standard. So I know that there was a lot of pressure in our community around just wait, just wait till next year. There's only nine weeks left. And, you know, as superintendent, I have to make some tough decisions. And, you know, based on that data, I made the decision that there are 40 to 50% of our students at least that couldn't wait. And so, um, you know, the decision was made and um, hopefully uh, our community and each of you understand, you know, maybe a little uh, or the, the decision make or the concept behind the decision making. Um, also, um, the, the, the mental, social, and physical health of our students are at risk as well. And um, seeing you know, CPS reports uh, that um, show a sharp decline in um, uh, reports to CPS is uh, very concerning. Because as we all know as educators, um, we have eyes on kids every day and, um, you know, those students need that or some of, the, of our students need that. And so um, for the well-being of our students, it's a, it's a good step in the right direction to have eyes on our students every day. Not that we're looking to report, you know, families, that's not what we're here to do. But, you know, for, for students and families that need us, um, they... Uh, they need eyes on on them every day. And so um, that was another really important decision or in, in principle in the decision making around making that transition. Um, so I know it's been difficult um, for all levels of this organization to make that switch um, from a two day model to a five day a week model. And um, I appreciate the commitment by each of you to pull that off. I know it was not easily done. And I know some departments have really put in a lot of extra time to make that work, transportation in particular. I think I was talking to Karen, just to keep things in perspective, I was talking to Karen and our drivers have uh, rebid their routes, which every time a route changes, they have to rebid. Uh, I think the number was eight times this year. So um, you know, typically they do a lot of work during the summer to create the routes and then you have one bid opportunity for our drivers. Uh, this year we've had eight different schedule changes and every time they have to go out and rebid those routes by way of uh, bargained agreements. So a lot of work um, by transportation and each of the buildings and teachers, you know, changing their delivery model and para ads changing their schedule. I mean, secretarial so i mean every level of this organization has had to commit to that um, change and it's been difficult but one that um, i stand behind that was the right move at the right time for our kids and so hopefully uh you've made it through that um that change and um one thing I will commit to you moving forward for the rest of the year, um, we're not looking at another substantial change. <laughs> and I hope that that eases a lot of your minds. Um, but, you know, uh, um, it was the right time 
to to look at that that move. So thank you for your support with that. And hopefully um, if you've read the letter and you know what I've articulated this morning makes sense to you and um, you know we're doing the right thing. And uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Uh, we did look at a uh, AMPM model last summer with our reopening group. Um, but you know, no one could have foreseen what we've experienced this year. I don't know that we had a true perspective on what 2021 would look like. So um, I appreciate your hard work and that each of you have done to make that change on behalf of those students. I always call them those students that need us the most. You know, there are students in our system that are gonna do well because they have supports at home, um, regardless of what kind of delivery model we have. But there are some students that will really struggle without their teachers and their paras and their secretaries and a caring principal and um, other supports and a drive bus driver to check in with them every day. So um, I appreciate everybody working so hard to carry that out on behalf of those families that really need us. So the second item I wanted to address today is um, SBA assessments. Uh, the state of Washington has, and this is as of yesterday, so I don't have any news today, um, but the state of Washington and OSPI, Chris Rakedahl, has er, had um, submitted a waiver request to the federal government to uh, change our uh, spring testing in the state of Washington. And what they had asked for was um, a model that would, they called it a sampling model, and it would test a portion of uh, students across the state. We have about 700,000 700, students in the state of Washington that take, take the SBA each spring. And uh, the model that OSPI was advocating for with the federal government would have tested by sample uh, somewhere in the range of 30 to 40,000 students across our state and would have been a reduction in uh, the number of assessments, um, you know, that, that the sample would take as well. Uh, the federal government has um, denied that request. And according to Chris Reichdahl yesterday, um, the federal government is really um, determined to have states across the nation assess children for the purpose of understanding the results or the, um, you know, the, the, the impact and the learning loss of the COVID um, closures. So, I know in our superintendents meeting yesterday, both Chris Rechdahl and the superintendents across this region are all advocating for um, some relief as it relates to SBA assessments and just believe that developmentally and the mental and physical well being of our students, you know, to have a full battery of SBA assessments when we really know what the result will be, because each of you are ingrained in that work. Um, you know, uh, it just doesn't make sense. But the federal government, you know, um, right now is really digging their heels in around um, states will give the assessment. So I don't have a final definitive answer today, uh, but within the next week or two, we should. And that's what Chris um, uh, referenced to us yesterday. I know that that it, planning for the assessment is a big deal. Actually carrying out the assessments in the classroom is very time consuming. I understand that. Um, as soon as we get uh, word from the state of Washington around, you know, what our testing program will uh, involve, uh, we will communicate with that with you accordingly. Um, there is really two concepts out there, or three concepts that was was discussed yesterday. One was, you know, the government, the federal government, is really asking for a full battery of the assessments, all the SBA assessments, just as you know, we've done pre-COVID. There is a state out there 
uh, and I think the state is uh, Colorado that has, they're, I believe, the only state in the union that has a waiver approved. And my understanding of that waiver is that uh, all tests will be given, but maybe instead of a third grade, as, uh, third grade assessment being math and reading, they might just do reading. And then in fourth grade, instead of doing reading, they do math. And so, you know, taking a portion of the assessment and are articulating across that all of our assessment grades, but not doing the full battery, so to speak, is maybe a concept that um, uh, our state is, is reviewing right now with the federal government to see if we can offer some relief that way, where a grade only gives one, one content area assessment. That's one area or that's one concept that's being discussed right now between the state of Washington and the government, the, uh, the federal government. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. The second concept that is being discussed is, um, uh, and is a um, assessment that would be um, applied next fall. So take the spring SBA assessments and um, test our students in the fall. That's also being discussed between the state of Washington and the federal government. That one's a little particular because what that would um, involve would be, so if a third grader advances to fourth grade, he or she would take the third grade assessment in the fall as a fourth grader. So that's a little bit different, different kind of concept, but they would, you know, just delay the assessment by several months, uh, but still complete their third, their third grade assessment and fourth graders would do the same and fifth graders as they advance through our system. The real, the real, the real advantage or the real, uh, the advantage to that is moving it to next fall. The disadvantage would be, there would still be a spring assessment. So in theory, if you're a fourth grade student, you would do the full battery of fall assessments as a third grader, and then you would still be responsible for carrying out the full battery of assessments for fourth grade in the spring. So it's, it's complicated to say the least. Um, you know, I know that leaders across our region are advocating for relief around um, assessments, and it's not that any leaders in this area don't believe that there's not value in the federal assessment, there is, absolutely. But, you know, um, there's a, and, and this is my belief as well, um, you know, our time is so precious this year to start addressing the learning loss, to spend any of our time, you know, uh, uh, assessing students on a test we probably know how they're going to do based on the experience this year is, uh, I think our time could be better spent teaching and, and learning um, this spring. So uh, we're we're working as a as a group here in the, on the Olympic Peninsula and trying to advocate for um, some flexibility, uh, but right now that's not going well. That's my report to you today, and I'm not trying to be uh, to present bad news, but I just want folks to be prepared that you know there there will likely be an assessment this spring. Um, best case scenario would be next fall. So more to come on that. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk a little bit about return to school for next fall. Um, a few weeks ago, CDC came out with uh, guidance around six foot versus three foot. And I think most of you are probably aware of that. Um, the Department of Health uh, for the state of Washington reviewed that in really a, a quick fashion. And um, Governor Inslee, prior to spring break, announced that classrooms would advance from six to three foot based on uh, the Department of Health's uh, vetting of CDC's new guidance. Um, our county has, and when I say our county, our health officer, Dr. Barry, um, worked with the superintendents after that announcement and um, wanted to know kind of where we sat in that, in that, um, discussion as far as six versus three in the classrooms this spring. 
and um, each of the districts across this region really advocated for, um, you know, uh, uh, or supported the concept of maintaining the six foot right now. And Dr. Barry, that's Dr. Barry's um, uh, position as well. And I'm going to explain why she's there. Um, the real challenge for school districts, if you're going from a six versus a three, is in the guidance, uh, if you get down into the nitty gritty of the guidance, um, there still has to be six foot between uh, students when they eat. There has to be six foot between adults. There has to be six feet in common areas, you know, like halls and bathrooms. And, and so the logistics of that um, are daunting to say the least. I mean, if you just look at if it's okay to have, you know, a three foot, you know, uh, distance in a, let's say a sixth grade classroom, that's fine, but when those students leave to go to another location and you, um, you have a requirement of now six foot and where would you, you know, you can't eat in the classroom anymore because you've taken and doubled the size of your class and so you don't have space for all potentially 26, 27 students. The gym's not a really likely solution or the commons area wouldn't be a likely solution because you would have to start lunches at nine in the morning and probably finish up near three o'clock in the afternoon with the number of lunches you would have to serve. So um, the, the intent was really good by the Department of Health and, the, and Governor Inslee, um, but the logistics behind the scene um, just uh, uh, would be daunting to say the least. We could probably figure it out, but um, it was difficult. But the, the, the deal breaker was um, Dr. Barry, uh, her position is she uh, just believes that it's too soon. Um, and her position was, if we go to a three foot um, distance in the spring, because it's too soon, we will likely have community transmission within our schools. It will happen. And so uh, she was really advocating with the superintendent group. We were thinking logistics. She was thinking, you know, the community transmission and just the virus itself within schools and that six versus three barrier. And so she um, really believes that now is not the time, you know, to go from a six versus a three uh, um, uh, uh, distance. Then we asked, so, well, what's different for next fall? Well, the biggest difference next fall is we will likely have herd immunity by way of um, uh, vaccinations, by way of starting, you know, student vaccinations. Um, if uh, families are uh, interested in that, that's now being offered to 16 year old, 16 years and greater. Um, there's a likelihood that, you know, uh, by midsummer, uh, this is what she shared last week, that midsummer there could be uh, vaccinations available to as, as um, young as 12 years of age. <clears throat> so having, you know, our adults in our community and our students in our community get closer to herd immunity is a big deal. Um, and I know you've heard a lot about that, but um, for her, that's what she's really looking at. So then the next question is, well, what does herd immunity mean? How many, how many people need to be vaccinated or have had the virus in order to have herd immunity? Her sweet spot is somewhere between 60 and 70%. Okay? And so that's the target. And that's the biggest difference between what this spring looks like and next fall would look like is we will very likely have in uh, in her opinion uh, herd immunity in our community, not schools, but in our community, which is uh, the the most important piece. So I want everybody in this room to hear today, um, and I should have started with this because I wanted to start and end with it. But 
we here and there's a lot of work to do between now and next fall. And I know many of you, I don't even want to talk about next fall. I have to finish this year first and I get it. But the job of a superintendent is to always be working, you know, six months in advance. And so we're, we're starting to, you know, work on the, the, the plans and the logistics around next fall. I want everybody in this organization to hear from me today. And today is April 14th. 2021, we are going to use every ounce of our political influence, my political influence, our political influence from the board on down through this entire organization to make sure that our students are back to school full time next year. I want you to hear that from me today so you can start your planning. We are going to do everything in our power and i know we have some guidance coming out and from department of health um, because they are addressing that lunch issue and they are addressing the commons issue and you know likely some of that will go away as we experience herd immunity but we are going to work my commitment to this organization is i will work and we will work as hard as necessary to make sure that all of our students are back full-time next year that want to be back so um that's that's my commitment to you and our commitment to you and um you know that's that's fall of 2021 will look very different for our organization and hopefully for the state of washington and education in general so <clears throat> hopefully that excites you as much as that excites me um and uh um you know it's uh, we have a lot of work to do but we'll get it done the next item I want to discuss is graduation. So um, Carmen put together a press release a few weeks ago around uh, high school graduation. Um, talk about experiences. Our seniors have really, um, you know, had a challenging year as their senior year uh, around um, this COVID uh, closure. But the good news is our graduation will be in person minus anything unexpected happening, like a, a massive explosion of, of COVID across our community. Um, you know, uh, and we don't, I don't believe that's going to happen, nor do I believe that uh, Dr. Berry believes that's gonna happen. We will have an in-person graduation. Our seniors will be on site to experience the summary of um, a 13 year experience within our organization or within the school district. So um, also, it's really exciting that uh, recently the Department of Health have come out with guidance that uh, is specific to high school graduations. And, you know, we're connected to phases now, and you've heard the news that some, some counties are moving back to phase two, which starts to eliminate some of the offerings that school districts can do, like uh, athletics and some different things. But graduation is exempt from phase from the phases uh as long as it's not lower than phase two if you go to phase one i think there would be a different result but um we're currently in phase three and phase three allows for um, in-person graduation to occur with up to 400 spectators and so even if and this is as of today and we all know that covid can change things but as of today um uh, our state of Washington will allow, even if we regress back to phase two over the next few weeks, we will still be able to have an in-person graduation with 400 spectators um, uh, because uh, the, the, the Department of Health has offered that um, uh, exemption as long as it's outdoors and ours is outdoors. So that's really good news for our seniors that um, you know, they're going to have an in-person, they're going to have some of their friends and families there to, you know, cheer them on for their accomplishment. And that's a, that's a big deal. So provided that, you know, we don't regress down to phase one, which I don't think anybody believes that's where we're headed. Um, you know, we will have an in-person graduation and recognize our seniors for um, a phenomenal accomplishment. So that's, that's good news. Um, and um, I'm appreciative of the work of both, you know, the state and our local health officer because uh, Dr. Barry has also approved that. So 
Um, and now finally, the last piece that I wanted to speak about today is, um, wow, time flies. It's already 30 minutes. I want it to be done prior to 30 minutes. I'm almost done. So um, as we get vaccinated and as the weather changes, and isn't it beautiful? Like, oh my gosh, the next 10 days. I love it. I love the heat. Um, but, you know, at, and, and the tail end of the pandemic and folks are starting to travel and things are getting back to more normal, we cannot lessen our attention to detail. Um, you know, all of the protocols that we put in place must maintain, um, you know, to uh, avoid any um, problems within, within our schools. And so uh, continuing to wear your mask, continuing to practice social distance, continuing to fill out your attestation, continuing to stay home when you're sick, all of those pieces that have worked not just in Port Angeles, but across the state of Washington. Um, you know, we really need to double down on that and stay focused. I know it's easy, you know, to, to default back, well, I'm fully vaccinated and, you know, do I really need to? The answer is yes, you really need to. And your commitment to that, you know, now and through the end of the year um, is, is really, really important for us to continue to um, operate with in-person services uh, across our school communities and, um, and also the health and safety of all involved. And because even though we have a large percentage of our uh, staff vaccinated, you know, we still have students that, uh, you know, have not been vaccinated yet, particularly at the middle and elementary level. So, um, stay focused on that and, um, you know, we will continue to be focused on our cleaning protocols and everything that's, that's necessary to make our schools a safe location. So with that um, being said, those are really the areas that um, I wanted to address today. And um, I'm appreciative of your time and welcome back. And uh, um, I... Uh, look forward to, to getting out in each of your buildings very, very soon. So thank you very much for your time today and uh, enjoy the sunshine. Have a great day.